right. Glad you guys are here today. Uh, we are in the middle of the story, like Karina said, and uh, again, like she said, I want to get everybody caught up in case you aren't familiar with the journey that we're on. Uh, we are basing um, this, this very long series. We've never done anything like this as a church before, uh, but we're taking 31 weeks to walk through a book called The Story. And this book is just a, uh, a collection of, um, uh, it's a condensed version of the Bible that's then put into chronological order. And so it solves what can be at times a problem, or I shouldn't say a problem, a, a challenge with the Bible, which is that it can be hard to see the one big story the Bible is telling because of the way it's put together. Now, the way it's put together is great, it works fine, but sometimes, again, it can be hard to see the one big story inside it. And that's what this book aims to do. It aims to help kind of make those challenges a bit easier. And so what it does is... is the story is laid out in 31 chapters, and it reads more like a novel than, than a regular Bible does. And each one of those chapters, it, it kind of works through just like a novel would, uh, coming to, uh, to where we are today, which is chapter 15. We're almost halfway through this journey. But rather than just walking through all 31 weeks straight through beginning to end, we've broken it up into some sub-series uh, just to make it a little bit easier to digest. Now, if you're interested in this book, if you would like a copy of this book, uh, we do have those in the back. Uh, they're available for purchase. We got these from a, from a supplier for $5 a piece, uh, which was an incredible deal. Um, and so, uh, so if you don't have one and you would like one, we do have some in the back there. Uh, you can grab one. Uh, and um, uh, I'm not sure if anybody's going to be there after service. Just grab one. Uh, and then if nobody's there, it's We'll take care of it later. It's not a big deal. Uh, but we would love to have you take advantage of that if you would like a copy of the story to go on this journey with us. Uh, today we're in chapter 15. And again, that's about halfway through. And so we've covered a lot of ground. So very quickly, I wanna try to get us kind of caught up on where we've been. If you've been around, I know you, you've heard this, but, but if you haven't been, let me get you caught up. So there's, there's a timeline that we've got where I can kind of show you what's going on. So we started chapter one, the creation of the world, the fall of humanity, and then the flood. And then we've covered uh, about, uh, about 1,500 years now, or not quite 1,500 years, I'm sorry, uh, from, from about 2100 BC where Abraham was. We've covered all the way up till last week, we saw where the kingdom of Israel divided in about 930 BC. Now, obviously, there's a lot that's happened there. But at the end of the day, what is critical to understand is that this one story the Bible is telling starts at a very specific point. It starts with a God who creates and orders the world and who, when he creates people, says, this is the pinnacle of my creation. This is the best part. And God's whole goal with it is to spend time with us, which is kind of crazy and amazing. But that's what God's goal is. That's his heart. That's his passion. That's what he wants. And then when humanity falls, it, it, it breaks that relationship. And that is a critical moment in the narrative of the story because very early on, as this happens, this relationship with God is fractured. It means that God then begins a new journey to try to restore that relationship with us. Now, God doesn't have to do that. And, and I think that's one of the things that sometimes I haven't, I don't know that I've said it quite this way, but, but it's crucial to understand that God doesn't have to do that. God, God chooses to do that because he loves us. He wants to be in a relationship with us. And so he chooses to go on this rescue journey. And the rescue journey at its beginning stages looks like God choosing a family and saying, I want the whole world to know me. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna bless you and I'm gonna set you apart to be my representatives in the world. And so listen to what I tell you to do. Do the things I tell you. If you do that, you are gonna have just so much abundance and blessing that you're gonna be able to bless the whole world and demonstrate to them my heart for the world. But that plan doesn't go great. In fact, it, it goes kind of terribly. That, that's not because God didn't know what he was doing. It's because God knew exactly what he was doing. And God knew that we're not always the smartest. 
God knew that we don't always understand the things we need to understand from the jump. God knew that he needed to take us on a journey where he could demonstrate time and time and time again that the human heart is fundamentally drawn away from him and toward ourselves. And that's not very encouraging. <laughs> But the majority of what we know as the Old Testament of the Bible, which is where we are in, we're kind of in the middle of the Old Testament, the majority of the Old Testament is really, I like to kind of think about it this way, it's like this case study into how messed up people are. It's like this case study that demonstrates that if we're left to our own devices, we just are not gonna pursue God, we're gonna pursue other things. I don't like to admit that about myself. I don't like to stand on a stage and say, hey, welcome to City North. Did you know that you're not gonna pursue God if left to your own devices? Like, it's not. I'd rather stand here and be like, you know what, we're, humans are great and, 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 and we're all just, you know, we're kind of inherently good and we're gonna do a good job pursuing God and it's just, it's gonna be, I'd rather say that. But it just isn't true. And, and, and it's not true in some pretty obvious ways when you really think about it, right? I mean, I don't know how many of you have kids. I know many of you in the room, and I know a lot of you do have kids. And if you've ever been around a young kid or had your own, you know you don't have to teach them to be bad. <laughs> They're pretty good at it. It was funny. I was, I was over here in a conversation this morning between um, an individual and my mom. And uh, <laughs> mom looked at me and said, hey, she's trying to give me her kids. Because, you know, it's just one of those seasons of life where you want to string up your kids. And uh, the individual looked back at mom and said, uh, well, I mean, like, clearly you did okay. <laughs> and mom looked back at her and said, well, you weren't around when they were your kid's age. <laughs> like, you, you might not have thought I was doing a good job then. Right, like, like we, don't, we don't have to teach our kids how to make bad choices. We don't have to teach them how to disobey. We don't have to teach them how to not listen. We don't have to teach them how to be selfish. I mean, even, even like the kindest hearted kids at times, as my daughter stares bullets through me, uh, even the kindest hearted kids, you don't have to teach them how to want what they want and at times pursue it no matter the cost to everybody around them, right? You don't have to teach it. It's built into us. Now, as adults, we mostly learn how to not behave that way because there's negative consequences if we do. But the reality is all of our hearts are still drawn to want what we want and to pursue it at all costs. And, and so the Old Testament of the Bible is just example after example after example after example after example of God's chosen people who should know better because they've seen God do some of the most miraculous, incredible stuff that anyone has ever seen. They just keep pursuing their own things. And here we are, thousands, thousand plus years into God's relationship with his family, and they're still just messing it up over and over and over. In fact, they're messing it up now in such a significant way that in chapter 14, we saw how the kingdom of Israel, which God had been working to establish for hundreds of years, the kingdom of Israel, just one generation removed from its peak, splits in half and there's civil war. And so now there's a northern kingdom and there's a southern kingdom. And the northern kingdom is led by a king and the southern kingdom is led by a king. And, and they go through these periods where they just war with one another and and the reality is they can't in any way represent God to the world because what kind of person would want to follow a God who fundamentally is at war with himself, right? That doesn't, you wouldn't want that. And so all that God has been trying to do, all that has been happening for all these years, it's just falling apart. Now, when we left off last week, I, I, I covered these two kings named Rehoboam and Jeroboam. And they're the two kings that, where, where the kingdom divides. And I kind of left it there. But chapter 14 goes on to list out several other kings in both the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And the kings of the northern kingdom, they're just wicked. They're, they're all bad. None of them do what God wants. None of them follow the Lord. The kings of the southern kingdom are mostly bad, but there are a few good ones sprinkled in and out. But, but then chapter 14 ends by introducing a king named Ahab. Ahab was as bad as it gets in the northern kingdom. And as chapter 15 begins, Ahab is a central figure in the narrative. 
But more than that inside chapter 15, and, and hopefully if you're a part of this journey, hopefully you read the chapter this week so you're familiar with some of these stories. But as chapter 15 unfolds, we're introduced to kind of not, not a new series of characters, but a series of characters that we haven't seen in this way. In fact, chapter 15 is kind of a hinge point for the narrative because it's at this point that we start to see the emergence of the prophets. There have been prophets throughout the history of the nation of Israel at various points in time, but the prophets have never played the kind of role in the story that they are about to play starting now. Chapter 15 starts off by introducing us to Elijah, who is one of the most important prophets in the history of the nation of Israel. And there's this really cool scene between Elijah and King Ahab and his wife Jezebel on the, on the top of a, of a mountain called Carmel. And it's, it's a crazy story. It's one of the most epic, awesome stories, I think, in the Bible, but we're not going to cover it today because I preached on it last week and it's or last summer and it's it's in here you can read it it's great but there's this epic battle and and Elijah proves that that the God of Israel his God is the true God not these other gods that they're worshiping and it's a really neat moment but then it kind of devolves into chaos because then the king and queen are out to kill Elijah. And Elijah has this moment where, this is, this is a total side note, but I think it's an important one. Elijah has this moment that's easy to gloss over the significance of. It's this moment where he goes and, and he sits down and he essentially just laments to God about how terrible everything God has asked him to do has been. And it's an important moment for a couple reasons. One is that we have a tendency to read the Bible through this lens that says like, if I ever have hard questions for God or, or if I struggle with the things that God asks me to do, that must mean that I don't have enough faith. And I don't think that's true. In fact, I think that one of the central tenets of the Bible is that God is big enough to handle our big questions. God is big enough to handle our big concerns. And what God is actually looking for is honesty inside of us when we go to him and approach him. Not this kind of sugar-coated cookie cutter like, well, God, I trust you, when, when inside what we're really doing is saying, why would you ask me to do all these things if it was just gonna be chaos? Because God already knows that's inside of us. And by us withholding it from him, what we're saying is I don't really trust that you're big enough. And so it's this important moment to me because Elijah is very honest with the Lord about how he feels and, and, and how he's struggling. It's also important to me because uh, it, it, it reads like somebody who's really anxious. And again, I think there's been this stigma in the church for many years that, that anxiety or depression are bad in and of themselves, and they're not. In fact, I think the Bible's full of examples of people who are struggling with, with anxiety and with depression and, and who wrestled with God within that. And so it's a really interesting story, but... Again, that's kind of a side note. Elijah goes through all this and, and there's these really cool moments and, and Elijah is now revered as one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament. But nothing changes. The job of a prophet is to give messages from God to the people and Elijah does it faithfully, but nothing changes. And eventually, Elijah, God tells Elijah that he's gonna raise up another prophet to succeed him and Elijah goes and passes the mantle to a man named Elisha. And Elisha is another incredible prophet. But same kind of deal. Nobody listens to Elisha. He prophesies and, and, and he, he calls the people to return to God and they just won't do it. And eventually Elisha dies and there's more prophets. But, but it's at this point in the story that all of a sudden we see that the kings take a back seat. Now, the Bible doesn't explicitly say why that is. But it's interesting that if you look at the narrative as a whole, and that's one of the reasons I like this journey so much, because hopefully it'll be kind of easy to see this. If you look at the journey as a whole, it started out with a family just following God, or trying to anyway. There wasn't really, um, there wasn't really like a seat of authority per se. There, there wasn't a king. There wasn't a ruler Eventually, God raised up a man named Moses who, who led the people and, and, and then Joshua who succeeded Moses. But, but there wasn't like this, this, this person who sat on a throne of authority. You know what I mean? And then eventually the people say, we want a king so that we can look like all the other nations. And so that king will lead us. And God says, you don't really want that. And they say, yes, we do. And they say, no, you don't. Yes, we do. And so God says, fine. And at this point, it's pretty obvious why God said, you don't really want that, because the kings haven't been successful. In fact, the kings have just gradually led Israel further and further and further away from him. And so now God begins to raise up prophets. 
And there's one important goal of the prophets. It's interesting because it's really the same goal. I, I have found myself in the last few weeks as I've prepped some of these messages struggling a bit because I'm like, I feel like I just keep saying the same stuff. But the reality is that's kind of what the Old Testament is. It's, it's God just kind of rehashing the same message over and over in different ways because the people just aren't getting it. And I wanna show you that today because today in a lot of ways is just a recap of everything that's come before. Eventually, about 175 years after the kingdom of Israel divides, we have this series of kings in the northern kingdom who are just bad. We have Ahab, and then there's a whole series down from there, and they just get worse and worse and lead the people further and further away from God. And, and then we have these kings in the southern kingdom, and again, some of them are good, but not all of them. And the southern kingdom is doing the same thing. It's just further and further away from God over time. Eventually, God raises up two prophets named Hosea and Amos. And chapter 15 of the story ends with prophecies of both Hosea and Amos. Again, we're about 175 to 180 years now after the kingdom divides. Both the north and the south, things are not good 